So I'm here with Carrie Nibblack. Did yes, I get that correct? You got it correct. Yes, Carrie you nailed Niblack, it. Yes, president of Blackwell Captive Solutions. How are you doing, Carrie? I am wonderful. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming in. And I know we had, you know, the, obviously all the <laughs> stuff that's going on with the planes. I, I was uh, a victim of the FAA's down mm -hmm. system uh, the other day, which wasn't very much fun. And then you had weather coming in, right? Yeah, from Indianapolis. pretty turbulent coming in storms from Indianapolis, but couldn't wait to come visit you and all's good. Little bumpy ride. Little bumpy. Okay. It's, you know, you just buckle down, you know, it's like lean to company, right? Yeah, well, we're <laughs> on stable ground right here on the couch and we can be relaxed, but right. I really appreciate you coming in and this is fun. Even, I think you reached out to me as a matter of fact mm -hmm. as well. And when you kind of said, Hey, I'd love to be on the show and this is what I do. I'm like, yes, I love it when somebody proactively reaches out to me and also I'm excited to talk to them simultaneously. And then we had that initial call and I think you and I hit it off instantly as well. So instantaneous. That's yeah. yeah, instantaneous. Just uh, like attracts like and just uh, really relaxed. Cool. Yeah. Well, you, we're going to talk captives. Let's, let's sure. get that out of the way. Captives sure. will be the core subject matter. Mm -hmm. It's something I've covered on a couple of occasions as well. And I think it's something that's relevant to continually cover. Uh, but before we do that, I think you have some interesting things about you and your backstory and your life. And so why don't you let the audience know a bit about who you are? Yeah, sure. So Carrie Niblack, been in the business 30 plus years and and started at the bottom. Okay. Um, it was it was a great training ground, Spencer. I started way back in the 1980s, actually paying claims. Did back you? when, yeah, okay. back when younger folks will find this hard to imagine with all today's technology technology and AI and all that, but used to bring out claims in tubs and they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were color coded like red, green, black, and you had these old filing rooms for individuals and families. And the reason that that's important is because it started from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that operational knowledge just carried me forward in all the leadership positions I've had. Um, that background makes you a better leader mm -hmm. because you know all the ins and outs of how the self-funded puzzle fits together. Well, not to mention when you're paying the claims, I mean, that's a very uh, high level responsibility, right? There are yes. hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars at mm -hmm. stake based on the way that that was adjudicated and all the things that you have to check for. I mean, money mm -hmm. is flowing based on those decisions. So, you know, that's good to know, like right. how much impact you're having on the, the workflow just by doing the claims component. Exactly. Yeah, I had someone say to me very early in my career, Every time you keystroke or hit the enter button and you're issuing that money with employers funds, mm -hmm. you are a steward of their money yeah. and treat it accordingly. It was, it was grand advice that's followed throughout my entire career. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it's great advice, but it, it's true too. I think mm -hmm. sometimes, especially as young people, I've, I've been a guilty of it myself is not knowing where you fit in the bigger picture, right? You do your job, maybe sometimes just pulling a lever or, or hitting enter on a button that you don't quite understand the broad based impact of what you do. Right. Having somebody that's been through it before and give you that perspective mm -hmm. is, is really important. And mentorship, I think is a big part of your career as well. And I want to touch on that in a moment, but tell me, walk me a little bit forward in your career sure. as you progressed and things like that. Sure. So just continued uh, moving up in operations around age 30 I stopped and went to law school so I am an ERISA attorney by trade we joke that I'm a nice one <laughs> a friendly nice wait a day <laughs> yeah. ERISA attorney is usually yeah. not nice is that is that a, a thing <laughs> Not as good as me, okay, right? Okay. Yeah, I get, yeah, but um, user friendly is how we call it. Okay. But um, stopped, went to law school around age 30, came back. I was in house counsel uh, for American United Life in Indianapolis, now one America. And I got the proverbial call that we all get hey, come have breakfast with me. Mm -hmm. um, this may sound strange, but we need someone to come lead our sales team and our client relations team. And, and your experience would be wonderful for that. Okay. And so, what I tell people who, who ask me about that all the time, they think that's a weird transition is that the same skills I use as a practicing attorney, I very much use and then some being a leader in our industry. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're just not in litigation, but from a, a sales perspective, understanding pros and cons of decisions, knowing your audience, all of those things that I would do in a courtroom before um, or with contract mm -hmm. work. Every day as a CEO or president, I pull on those skills do we take this product solution? What's the pro? What's the con to our client? What's the price point? Um, how do we position? Mm -hmm. So all of those things are using the same skills. Absolutely. And so I tell, talking about mentorship, I, I tell folks all the time, those skills will serve you well no matter what industry you're in. Mm -hmm. Because what it's really teaching you is how to make educated decisions quickly which from a leadership position is crucial. 
to yeah. success. Well, now you mentioned obviously the I think the when I think about the the legal skills right that you yeah. brought to the table, and I, I think you did a good job of parlaying how those skills would transfer to mm -hmm. sales. I'm kind of going through you know what I know about the legal profession and thinking about litigation and being in a courtroom and thinking about having to you, positioning was the right word I think you used were mm -hmm. knowing how to position something yeah. right. You have all the facts laid out before you, but you still have to position it effectively because if you let's say you have a defense attorney that uh, just to use that particular example that. It just is unlikable, right? Mm -hmm. You may have a, done a really good job of laying mm -hmm. out the facts, but he's representing or she's representing their client, and they're just not very likable, mm -hmm. and they're not very per persuasive, or they don't really do a good job of actually uh, t telling the story. Mm -hmm. Those things would impact a buyer, it impact exactly. a jury, and things like that. So I could see how that would absolutely convey. Radeon Health's Level Funded Plus offers brokers and consultants transparent and reliable level funded insurance for groups as small as 10 employees. With national PPO network access and 100% return of claims fund surplus, small groups can gain more control over healthcare spend without the need for IHQs or claims data. Discover a great alternative to fully insured plans at levelfundedplus.com. Yeah, I spent a summer in law school working for the top jury consultant in the country. And I worked on a case with her, an, an LAPD case, where there was a death involved. Um, and, I, and I will be honest, I would tell her this. <laughs> um, I, you know, you go into that and I thought, this doesn't work, right? This yeah. doesn't work. And, and cutting to the chase, what she, t what she enhanced and, and confirmed for me was, you walk into a room, people form opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're leading a captive, uh, you're leading a TPA, you're selling cars to your point, your defense attorney and the jury doesn't like you. And I took those skills and got really adept at product solutions, understanding customers' needs. So it wasn't sure. coming in and doing a PowerPoint. It was walking in with confidence and understanding what does your business need today? And, and having a, a conversation with you over coffee or some of my best sales in my career were me and a cup of coffee or Diet Coke um, uh -huh. with a family-owned business yeah. where they could not sustain the increases, and we found solutions very quickly for them. Okay. No PowerPoint involved. Yep. Me getting to know that individual, their family, uh, their long-term business goals, three years, five years, and that's where I always start with our clients. Um, it's not about... Uh, Blackwell at the beginning. It's about tell me about you yes. and and what's important. Um, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I think you understand behavioral yeah. psychology probably at a yeah. fairly deep level, which I think is really important in sales. And I think you and I also could spend probably half an hour on this subject. And maybe we'll do that on a second go around. I would on a love podcast. that. <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I want to lean into it, but I feel yeah. like we do have a purpose for today. Yes. And you flew down here for that, and so I want to make sure we cover that. A couple unique things about you before we get into mm -hmm. the captive stuff, and I want you please to elaborate on some of things you have a family racing history and i have a a huge family racing okay. history my family's originally from speedway indiana my grandmother's house was literally five minutes from the indianapolis motor speedway so you could hear it and you and, and it, it's an event it's a month um my aunt who my mom's youngest sister roxy was a race car driver okay and she was only seven years older than me and so i had a blast i i got to join her on racing trips in the summer and hard driver this was this was danica before there was a danica right okay, when was this roughly? this was a i was in high school so this is, uh, 1980s okay, 1980s good. and i would go on racing trips with her in the summer and uh she was in that whole generation where she raced um uh, super v's and indy lights against michael andretti and alan sir jr and i got to i wasn't even legal yet i was in that <laughs> i was you know i could sit on her pit box and um just great stories um there was one in particular we were at milwaukee the milwaukee mile um they used to race there and it sits within the fairgrounds uh -huh. and so she didn't have enough practice time and so they moved her race car not kidding they moved her race car out, big thing out into like the fairground area and she was going around and the state police said uh they, they came up <laughs> like roxy um we love that you want to practice but you really can't do that yeah, in the fairgrounds right yeah um that's funny well and it, so i imagine you know racing back in the 80s might have been a little a lot different than it is yes. today right a lot less structured maybe yeah. formal but so how does one enter into racing you don't just be show up one day be like i want to drive one no. of these really fast cars so what what do you do to start building up the skill set to be a professional you driver? start early and okay. you can st you can start in different forms roxy started with quarter midgets okay. and and worked her way up won the championship in that and continued to progress um 
when she finished high school, even before that, when she finished high school, she dropped everything, graduated, and went to Europe and raised Super V's. Um, okay. Didn't know anyone over there. Didn't and, and what it also taught me, in all seriousness, was a lot about the business side of racing. So it's so let me let me give them credit. That community does so much charitable work and so tight knit. At the same time, you have to earn your chops. Sure. Right. And back then, with the innovation, you didn't have spec cars. It, it was all the the school of hard knocks and 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 really honing your craft in and starting out small you didn't just jump into something big mm. and and it was very much like our business a relationship business sure, sure. so i remember going one summer and, and driving to pittsburgh with her and chip ganassi if you if you have any idea this. i know the name oh, I yeah know. I can't huge him. uh owner in in indy cars uh, owned a nascar team um, we met him in Pittsburgh, where he's from, and he gave her an engine because okay. she needed it. Um, just gave her an just, engine. He just, okay. so he just <laughs> did to help her to help her out. I mean, that's a ton of money, but all you know, all kinds of things like that were um, Mario Andretti, particularly close to the Andrettis. Um, Mario Andretti gave my aunt away at her wedding. No uh, kidding. No kidding. Okay. And no kidding. And um, j you know, just being immersed in that that community, young. I learned a lot. Sure. Besides, you're, it's a blast. You're at the racetrack, right? Well, and didn't you say, obviously, in the 80s, you mentioned uh, Danica Patrick, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, in the 80s, uh, a woman driving professionally probably was a lot different and harder to break into. Mm -hmm. So, like, what did you experience during that time or see? Mm -hmm. Was there bias in any way? Was, sure. she, was she fighting an uphill battle, a glass ceiling, like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier? I want to hear some about that. Yeah, you know? totally. So, yeah. I can relate to that. So, and at the time, you know, I didn't know. I was younger, right? Probably, I, was, yeah, I, was, I didn't, I didn't, but, it, you know, hindsight now, at my age, in my experience, there are complete parallels. So she was fine glass ceiling. There were folks that didn't think women belonged in racing. Um, uh, you know, she had to. She had a few people that helped her. Uh, the Andretti's helped her. AJ Foyt was helpful to her. Uh, Chip Ganassi, uh, Bobby Rahal. We went to his house and, and we worked on a car and helped put a ride together. So there were there were key people that were helpful. That that still didn't mean she got a ride. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the Uno co Card Company, uh -huh. if you remember, yeah. they were a huge sponsor for her. Really. So those okay. great folks. Um, so she had some breaks, but ultimately, did not get the break. Uh, where she, her, her lifelong goal was to race in the Indianapolis 500, right? Our hometown, yeah, family sure. tradition, all that. Did not make that, um, but it but it taught us a lot. Well, that's such a, I mean, it's such a cool story, and I'm sure just racing is in your blood. Also, I, I would presume a lot of people in the Indianapolis area, mm -hmm. it, it is a big part of their, their history, whether directly or indirectly as well. That's not the only pro. <laughs> I don't want to call it a sport. I know it's not a sport, but a game that you're associated with. So you're a professional backgammon player? I am. Is it, so... Well, again, how does that even come to be? Like, how, do you just one day realize you're really good at it or what? <laughs> so Roxy comes back into the okay, story again. Right. So when Roxy was in Europe, she learned backgammon. And so she, when she came back home from Europe, um, I remember one Thanksgiving in particular where she's like, hey, you know, well, let me back up. Our entire family likes to compete. Okay. Whether it's, I'm sure that's shocking, no. <laughs> but whether it's sports um games in our family there is a big thing when you progress to the adult card playing tank right so it's 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 and there's no leniency you know as a as a kid when you get to that table people treat you like you know, an adult so okay. so if we back up there's one thanksgiving where roxy had come back from europe and racing super v's and she had a back end board and so she said come on i'll teach you how to play right okay. we were really close and so this was humbling for me. I can laugh about it. So she, so I'd never played. So she, she taught me the basics. And on that Thanksgiving day, we'll never forget. She, she beat me like sixty-five to nothing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and and so, um, backgammon is like leading a company. Backgammon's all about skill, risk, a little bit of luck, right, with the dice and strategy. Okay. So it's an appealing game to me for the same reasons I love leading companies because it's that you you're you know you're it's how much risk do you want to take in this game um, against your opponent and the cool thing now and you know is that you can play people all over the world. Sure, yeah, you're playing So virtually, I'm right? playing, you know, on any given day, I hop on the laptop and it brings up a 3D backgammon board and I'm playing people in Russia and China and Europe and uh, well, there's Do you tremendous. maintain a world ranking? I, I do. Okay, or can you share it? On the it's, not great. it's not great. <laughs> well, I imagine though, like world ranking, how many, how many, are we hundreds of thousands, oh, millions of people? Playing? Yeah, it's okay. crazy okay. And, and much more popular, I think, in, in other countries. But, but you know, again, um, there's this trend now to start with folks younger. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to get involved with 
um, youth yeah. and backgammon clubs. What fun that is, right? Yeah. Uh, this, some of what Roxy did for me. And again, it's it's so there there are parallels between these things, um, between racing, between backgammon. It's all about foot on the pedal, right? <laughs> Leading a company, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, muscle cars, race cars, yeah. but but it really goes to confidence. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, which impacts everything that we do. Sure. And, you know, as we start transitioning into the career and, and want to like hone in on the, the Blackwell mm -hmm. uh, part of your career is, and give you a chance to talk about it, what drew you to the captive space, all that stuff. But you told me, and something that has been impactful in my career is you love mentorship, love that it. you've had some great mentors mm -hmm. as well as you love to men mentor, which you just uh, suggested. So what has that meant to you in your career? And what is your perspective on how you mentor uh, young folks as well? This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. It totally changed my life. Okay. So I've had mentors throughout my entire career. Early on, back when I started processing claims, paying claims, I had someone who I, I didn't even report to her. She was a vice president of an insurance company who noticed me. I was staying late. I wanted to learn how the pieces fit together besides just my day job mm -hmm. of paying claims. Wanted to learn more about the company. And there was one slot left, and she said, get her, her name was Mary, get her in the next management training class and back then it was serious you know we're in we're in suits and, and <laughs> you know dresses and you yeah. you you had to uh, learn all the functional areas of the company and you take exams you had to get a 95 percent or better or you lost your job that day okay right so this is they weren't playing around back then but what it taught me was the functional areas of, of all the different parts of the company I was thankful. It changed my life. And all I knew, this is a famous line of music, but all I knew is it helped me. I made more money per hour, right, yeah. at first, right? Yeah. You don't realize. And then you, you, you hindsight, and you, as you get into that, you realize, oh, my God, this is life-changing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If we fast forward, anyone who's worked for me, um, who interacts with me, knows about my love of giving back and mentoring. And especially now, as we are focused on succession planning in the industry, right? Sure. There's this knowledge gap. And... Um, whether it's the teaching giving back to them or even for myself. Um, I had a, a coach say to me, um, Mike Evans runs a company named Chorus in Indianapolis, and I worked with him for quite a while. He worked with our team, and he, this is what he said to me. He said, you are the, your, your emotional intelligence score is the highest we've ever seen. At the same time, I'm going to get on you because you are ignoring your own self. Ah. And so, so I think the message here is give as good as you get, but, but and the importance of that for both sides, right? So I'm a voracious reader. Um, I have a close knit circle of other presidents and CEOs where I call them and say, have you ever encountered this? What would you do with this? I had one of those calls yesterday with a very good friend of mine and, and he and I catch up every once in a while and it's just, you know, Hey, this is what I'm looking at. What are you looking at? And I think our industry is known for that collegial approach, mm -hmm. but, but I am passionate about if you work with me for me in our industry and if you need help or i can help answer any anything um that will make it easier for you that path that that we've all been down please say hello and mm -hmm. raise your hand and say i need some help right mm -hmm. and and my mom gave me great advice a long time ago and she said to me you meet people where they're at and there will be some people who will want to learn everything from you and it will be unlimited and other people meet them where they're at and they may not be as passionate and and just give each person again knowing your people mm -hmm. as much as you can and, and within their threshold right in teaching um and letting them watch you um you know certainly with the prior to the pandemic but this enhanced it i changed le i enhanced a leadership style and that is i started doing more cross-functional team meetings where younger people we had them at the table watching us work it, um, I remember one in particular incident where uh, we, we brought someone from the finance team into a sales strategy session because he had asked. Okay. And I said, sure. And, and, and I am, without naming names, I, I had some of my executive team look at me and like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, it was pivotal for him. 
just like someone had been pivotal for me. So I do stuff like that all the time, and I just, again, to your word, I have a real passion for it. Well, and I, be, I, I made the transition from finance to sales, so it can Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it can happen, and yeah. I'm glad you uh, obviously invited him into that conversation. But yeah. I want to go back just a step. You talked about sure. succession planning. That mm -hmm. is something that I think isn't being discussed right now right. enough. There is a generational gap, I think, especially in the benefits consulting world, where a lot of folks are either retiring, these practice leaders, agency owners, and or they're just selling and, and rolling up and riding off into the sunset. But it, do you perceive a generational gap? And then what do you think needs to be done better for that succession planning to be intentional about that? I do think there is a generation and knowledge gap. There are folks that are my age, and there's probably a 10 to 15 year difference than where we've got a whole new generation coming up. They're bright, they're passionate, I enjoy their energy, but that's a lot of foundational knowledge in that gap, yes, or, or, yes, right? absolutely. And so the best way, Spencer, that I know how to help that is to involve them in anything I can from a teaching perspective. And I'll, I'll give an example. Um, with SIA, with the Young Leaders Division, Yes. Um, over my, uh, my last two years, we intentionally challenged that division to come up with a business plan, so not just do the events and social and, and get to know each other, but let's let's roll up our sleeves, guys, and let's do a business plan to make the Young Leaders Division self-sustainable. That was a tall order. Okay. Um, and okay. <laughs> and but but I would do that if they worked for me. Yeah. And I'm hopeful that that helped those folks watching the board of directors and how we, we approach fiscal planning for the organization, um, thought process, uh, how we interact, um, the writing style. There, there, there's so much institutional knowledge in, uh, that we have that we can give back, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of, of those two coming together yeah. and eliminating the gap. Eliminating the gap. Yeah. yeah. So let's move forward in the gap, and not necessarily mm -hmm. in your career, but let's move forward into today's, um, you know, crux of today's conversation, which would be the captive sure. uh, space. Uh, so Blackwell Captive uh, Solutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, solutions. Mm -hmm. and you are the president mm -hmm. there. How'd you get into it? And then let's, in, why don't we, well, before we even do that, I love giving people an opportunity to define what some of these terms sure. mean. Um, in case somebody hasn't heard any of the past episodes on Captive, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you the space to say, in your own words, sure. Carrie, what is a Captive? Well, I love the question, first of all, yeah. because a lot of people don't. There's this mystery around Captives, yeah. right? Yeah. So let me debunk it. Yes, please. Um, for me, in plain language, not legal language, but plain language, a Captive is a shock absorber. Okay. for large claims. Okay. So you have like-minded employers, whether they're moving fully insured to self-funded or already self-funded, who pull together and there's an, a risk layer that they pull together and is insured. Mm -hmm. So for Blackwell, that's a floating 250,000. Okay. And, I, and I think it's really important for folks to understand that employers still have um, choice. You still have your own specific deductible, your own plan performance, that type of thing. You're really taking that middle layer mm -hmm. and spreading risk. Yes. Um, and, and that really, in plain terms, is what a, a captive is. Well, I like it. And that's a really good, succinct way to put it. I, mean, I, I suspect that most of the audience is at least averse in the terminology to a degree, but mm -hmm. I'd hate to start from you know, second and third base sure. and you're talking about captives in case somebody's going, hey, please, will you tell me what a captive <laughs> is? Um, but uh, thank you for that. And I always, always like to hear it from a human being, right? Because yeah. it's one thing to read a definition on a piece of oh, paper. Yeah. It's another thing to hear a human's interpretation who's lived in that space that talks it every single day. I like the way you said a shock absorber or that, would, that yeah, what you said. Yeah. yeah, that's a great terminology to use. But how did you get drawn to this space? Were you aware of it prior to, to joining? Mm -hmm. Okay. So certainly aware of it. So I got, again, another one of those calls, a, a big, big movement in my life usually occurs around a phone call from an industry colleague, uh, in, in this instance, an industry colleague who, who knew me as a chairwoman of SIA, uh, called me for uh, uh, some assistance on something else, and then just, you know, friends catching up. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've got uh, care capital and private equity, um, and, you know, we're thinking about starting a captive. And so, literally, I can still picture what I was wearing that day, like, like you know, the suit and, and where I was standing was in my dining room. And I said, wait, 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 hold on. Mm -hmm. Tell me more because I might be really interested in, in learning more about what you want to achieve with that. And so, literally, everything I do is fast-paced, right? So, literally, um, that phone call led to a couple other phone calls. And then I hopped on a plane, flew to California, okay. sat down with some of the, the great folks at Carrick, 
and uh, in a closed door session over five hours said, just conversation, this is my vision. Mm. It was one of the most fun days I've ever had. Exhausting, right, Mm -hmm. but exhilarating. And so there was this funny moment at the end of that where I stepped out, grabbed some Diet Coke, right, let the, gave them a moment, and so I peeked my head back in, and uh, this is, it was a funny light moment. Um, and Steve, he's, a, he's on my board of directors, so it was great, and I, I peeked around the corner and I said, knowing the answer, you want to proceed? Are we, are we good? And he's like, come on in and sit yeah, down. Come, <laughs> yeah. come, come on in. Come, come on, on in. in. I think Let's you're going to be here that. a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what, what was it about the space that was so attractive to you? I think as we continue um, post-ACA, mm-hmm. we are seeing more and more movement again to self-funding. Mm-hmm. Um, the numbers have changed. If you'd asked me years ago in, in the middle of my career who should be self-funded, the, the pat answer then was, well, you can't even talk about it unless you're 100 lives or more. Okay, I've written groups below, like at 25, yes. 26, right? Yes. Now, that's not the norm. No, that's atypical. But, but it's atypical, possible. but yeah. it's possible. So here's the other thing. They say changed plan dynamics, and you've got more folks coming in smaller. It's math. So, so it is tougher for those people to get stop loss or make mm-hmm. it affordable to be self-funding. And... Thus, the explosion captive. So when we look at the stats, and I'm, I'm going to do approximate, um, back in the late 90s, I think approximately 30 to 40 percent uh, of companies were self-funded. The number I saw recently was well over 60, mm-hmm. like 61 percent, mm-hmm. I believe, in 2020 was the stat I read in an industry white paper. Okay, so, so that movement to self-funding means that we have to come up with better solutions. Yes. Thus the shock absorber. So so everybody who's self-funding has stop loss. Now it, they may they may not have accurate depending on size, but they usually always have specific. They have that that umbrella to help cover the risk. Well, what a captive does and the reason why they are exploding in popularity is because it enables all those different sizes we just talked about mm-hmm. to pull and spread risk, yep. and the math works better. Yep. It's really that easy. When it's a lot more predictable, right? One of yeah. the things that you're selling is the long-term stability, exactly. that renewals and things right. like that, right? And I think if I'm a 25 uh, life group mm-hmm. and I understand the power of self-funding, but I have some trepidation about my own personal risk profile or our cash flow or my ability to pay a large claim or what is next year's renewal going to look like, you know, all those things that I'm sure mm-hmm. a business owner is going through that, that uh, Rolodex of, of concerns. Um, this eliminates many of those on the surface, right? And, you know, we get, you know, you can get into theory and spreadsheeting and a lot of captives don't like to be spreadsheeted and maybe sometimes numerically speaking on, on the paper, it might be a little more expensive in certain circumstances, but it's not, that's not just what you're buying, right? You're not just buying the cost. Mm -hmm. You're buying a lot of other things Mm -hmm. that come along with it. So as you start talking about the value with Mm -hmm. employers that are new to this idea, what are those things that are quantitative, but also maybe qualitative in nature that you emphasize? Well, I certainly go to the qualitative qualitative as well because the other thing I like about our industry and self-funding is like-minded employers are just learning. There's an evolution, much like our careers, Mm -hmm. there's an evolution for clients in this space learning from other clients and the sharing of information. So again, what made a captive company attractive to me? Well, you have best-in-class partnerships and you share with your friends, mm-hmm. right? You, you, you give people the choice. That's a Blackwell difference. We, we come at it slightly different, and this goes from my training and, and the years in the business, where our clients have a choice. So I look at it at here's the deck of cards, right? Here are yes. the aces. And if you were our client at Blackwell, you could come in and I'd say, okay, Spencer, like here's some aces. Um, you know, what's your threshold? What's attractive to you? What do you want for your employees? Where are their pain points, your pain points, cost structure? You certainly got to bring the quantitative into it. But, but a key difference is I have not lost that kid who learned how to consult, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and sell. And, and um, again, understanding how I best serve you. So the, the quantitative part then takes care of itself. But the other thing that's done for me is to get in a room with clients of a captive and just watch them talk yeah. or, yeah, and yeah. share. And I think that's unique. Well, that's one of the biggest things that I've heard folks that do participate in captives or folks that are mm-hmm. captive managers. It's like, yeah, we have these you know, semi-annual or annual summits of our employers, and they literally all get together and become friends, and they talk about what they're doing. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they're yeah. sharing 
the actual best ideas together because they don't perceive each other as competitors. It's actually like, no, we're in this pool together. I want you to do the good things we're doing so we protect our risk pool simultaneously exactly. as well. So there is not only my own skin as an employer in the game, but there's us as a group mm -hmm. have skin in the game together as mm -hmm. well, which I think is really cool. It yeah. creates a very collaborative environment amongst these employers. Um, Tell me real quick, we, we were talking about the explosion, I think is the word explosions yes. of captives. And I have perceived that from my, where yes. I sit as well, that they are growing in popularity immensely. Mm -hmm. Some of that you said was the ACA, some of it is maybe just broader, better education mm -hmm. in the market. Do you have any other sense of why all of a sudden this mm -hmm. is a hot button thing? Well, I think also goes to artificial intelligence. Okay. So with smaller groups, we have the ability uh, with less claims data to bring them over and convert from fully insured to self-funding. I think that's part of it. Okay. Um, I also think, again, it just goes to the math in eliminating as much volatility as possible. This is not usually almost always the, the number one cost for employers behind payroll. Mm -hmm. Some companies, it's, it's bigger. You, you have to wrap your arms around that. You have to stratify that risk. You have got to understand what that story, you know, the analytics tell us stories. And I think we've progressed with that. So again, why the explosion? Well, all those different reasons come to the table. And the solution is a captive solution. It fits, it's fits squarely in to address those different things, what the analytics tell us, um, the math, the spraying the risks, the communicating great solutions with each other, uh, the, the collegial aspect. Um, and again, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. We are stewards of their money. And I think employers being more cognizant in 2023 than they were ever before about what are we going to do mm -hmm. with in, with with embracing innovation but helping control the cost of it? Absolutely. But I just feel like, you know, that maybe 20, 20 years ago, um, you kind of, captives are almost like secret, right? Oh, yeah. It's like you get, it was, it was you society. Get some, <laughs> you get some guy or gal to come in the room and, like, right. I'm going to explain you something, then you don't talk about this with anybody else because this is something special. But now I feel like it is in our, you know, lexicon of language yes. right in, in the insurance world it's just something that people are talking about mm -hmm. saying captive they may not fully grasp it they're like oh maybe we should consider a captive mm -hmm. i i talked to a lot of younger producer consultants and they will ask me like what do you think about captives what, what, what would this group be good for a captive so at least they're thinking yes. along those lines they have a ways to go to feel comfortable with mm -hmm. it and be able to i would say consult properly mm -hmm. with a client around them however that's where i'm sure you guys come in yes. and really help with that consulting but it just seems to be something that is just becoming a lot more common and being demystified by our industry. We're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in America to fix health benefits one plan at a time. NavMD has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million Americans. Better benefits starts with data intelligence. Our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead. I love that word, the, the demystifying in, in everything we do, but especially captives, because when you boil it down to it's a shock absorber, right? Mm -hmm. And you strip away, and this is the great thing about being an ERISA attorney. When you look at our um, you know, differences, how we differentiate in the industry, right? When you look at our participation agreement, um, I, I grabbed outside counsel. Um, we're domiciled in South Carolina. Okay. So I want to I wanna give a big shout out to Joe McDonald at the DOI there and his team. Mm -hmm. We had smart people who, who got in a room and said, let's strip the nonsense, okay. right? Okay. Strip the nonsense. So U.S. based, um, it's a short agreement. Everything operationally with our setup from different treaty dates to ease with which our team works um, to just how we describe it. And I've challenged our sales team. Um, you get three or four slides, right? Take all that nonsense out. I don't want to see the full legal description, yes, right? Yes. Talk to folks with words they can understand oh, yeah, yeah. And, and comprehend. And I think that we're, we are being very successful at that. When I, you, so you mentioned domiciled in South Carolina. I know it's mm -hmm. been popular, at least historically, and maybe still mm -hmm. is popular to do it offshore in the Bahamas, the Cayman, mm -hmm. things like that. Talk to me about the pros and cons of each one of those arrangements, in your opinion. Yeah, so um, it was an easy decision to me just because of my familiar with jurisdiction, right? And um, call it the times, call it just my years of practice. It was important to me for us to be U.S. based. The reason is from a from a, and I'm trying not to use legal jargon, but from a jurisdictional purpose, you're here. 
and then and, and it, with everything I do, with um, every every decision, I went and met with people in person. Mm-hmm. So uh, we looked at different states, um, you know, Vermont, Tennessee, South Carolina. And again, a difference for me, and it's very much how I hope that people perceive we do business, is Joe's team were completely accessible to us. They helped explain things. You know, this, you know, this was, I've been in the business 30 plus years, but this was still a new territory for me. Okay. So, so I also think being a student of the business myself, um, I needed to learn and I actually read the code and I, and I sat down with them. We had tons of questions. We had outside counsel. Um, we had people, uh, the consultants we put on contract to help us and really immersing ourselves in that. And so a lot of that's gut too. Sure. Who did I feel comfortable with? And, and when, you're in this space, flexibility is a big thing. Mm-hmm. So, so we looked at, does South Carolina give us the ability to add new cells quickly, to pivot? So if, um, which has happened, if, if so, like if the auto industry comes to me and says, we want to pull employers, right? Um, how quickly can you do that? Mm-hmm. And not just auto, but that's an example. Um, pretty quickly, yeah. right? So I can pivot on a dime, um, being U.S.-based and being domiciled in South Carolina. And so the reason I love that is because I grow as we grow, mm-hmm. right? And, and the company grows and, and our clients grow and, and the sharing grows. And so um, that agility uh, is critical in this space. Well, and speaking of growth and companies growing, that has been a common kind of subject of the debate for me is, what is the right size mm-hmm. for a captive? Obviously, people understand on the low sure. end, yeah, 25 right. lives, maybe 50, depending on mm-hmm. the captive manager. But the upside, the, the the other end of the spectrum is always a question mark for me. And, you know, why well, I mentioned to you, and it's no, no obviously no surprise, David Voorhees and True Captive, they sponsored mm-hmm. uh, the show. Mm-hmm. We've talked about it, and he uh, one time suggested 1,000 might be the top mm-hmm. end. Not necessarily a hard top end, sure. but even when he said it, I was going, whoa, that seems like uh-huh. big for a captive. But you and I had this conversation the other day. Actually, theoretically, there doesn't necessarily have to be Just an artificial be. cap. So That's, what yeah. is your what is your opinion on kind of the right size range? And then maybe talk about what a big group would look like inside mm-hmm. of a captive, too. Absolutely. So I'm going to buck the trend, right? Okay. Please, okay. please buck the trend. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Foot on the gas, right? Shocking. So, so in general, when I talk about doing an intro to a broker, right, or a consultant partner, in our intro slides, we talk range from, you know, ideal would be like 50, but I'm going to go higher. I'm going to say 1500. But as we talked okay. the other day, and then I quickly say, but I'm going to take that off now yeah. because, because the math gets less beneficial as you get bigger. Mm-hmm. This means not beneficial. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think the big thing is with the sharing of ideas and best practices, okay, so I'm slightly bigger. That's still attractive to me, mm-hmm. right? To be with like-minded people who are innovative and want to buck trend. Um, I'm not going to tell them no, right? I mean, I think, again, you have to meet clients where they're at. So so uh, 50 to 1,500, we can go down to the 25, 26. That's state-specific. But I would also tell you if someone came to me and said, Carrie, you know, for Blackwell, we want you to do an RFP and we've got 1,800 lives, I'm not going to tell them no, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm going to sit down and, and we're going to work through it and we'll, we'll do the RFP process and we'll see. Yeah, so basically, rather than just put an artificial cap and yeah. say, oh, 2,000 lives is too much, or 2,500, mm-hmm. you go, does the math break down sure. at some point where it's less and less mm-hmm. uh, enticing to do right. so? And maybe by that point, they are better off just being served standing on their own mm-hmm. as a self-funded employer. Mm-hmm. But when you were, when we were having this conversation, I'm go- going, well, why did I have this mental mm-hmm. uh, blockade to say, well, no, there is a cap to captives. Like, it's not, not really, it's just... Over time, it's kind of like a bell curve, right? Exactly. Eventually, on the other side of the bell curve, it's going to have a diminishing return a, yes. as, as on the top end. But man, I could just, I started sort of theorizing in my head about, well, what, why not a 5,000 life group? Why not a 10,000? And what would the benefits still be to a jumbo size group? But I think it's important to have that conversation to go, hey, just because that rule may or may not have been said doesn't mean it actually exists. So mm-hmm. each individual circumstance should be weighed on its own actual merits. So what about the structure a little bit? And I think we'll have to obviously move towards the end here and start wrapping up a sure. future looking. But you mentioned some of the flexibility. And I think there was even a phrase you guys have about stability through flexibility. or mm-hmm. I, I can't remember mm-hmm. off the top of my head, but what was that? Uh, Essential phrase? stability, desired flexibility. Essential stability, desired right. flexibility. That may be the title of your podcast. But essential Love stability, <laughs> desired flexibility. So what does that mean to you guys? What that means is essential stability. We are the shock, shock absorber. Um, so 
we want to stabilize that year over year, year over year, excuse me, trend increase that's unsustainable, mm-hmm. that 40% increase, 50% increase. People can't do that, right? So we want to give the stability of uh, a shared pool sure. with our clients that makes self-funding sustainable. At the same time, flip the switch, I also wholeheartedly believe in desired flexibility, and thus operationally, my approach has been different than competition in that more treaty dates. Uh, we don't mandate that you choose all four aces that right. we present, right? right? right. Um, the other thing I think that we've done completely different is I'm notorious for eliminating red tape uh, and making this industry easy. And from an underwriting perspective, even, even the speed with which and the depth with which we do that, uh, one of my salespeople has 20 years underwriting experience. Besides being just a wonderful person, I picked her on purpose. Yeah. So, so she works daily with our chief underwriter. So what that means to a potential client is we firm and final three to four weeks earlier than someone else. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right? So so it's just, you know. Um, well, you, yeah, as a salesperson, right, you're doing everything you can to remove those barriers to a sale exactly. to make sure the stability side, like you said, is integral. It has to be there. They're mm-hmm. trusting you with it being stable. But being flexible enough to get it to that end line mm-hmm. and removing those barriers that prevent it from coming. Mm-hmm. And I think the language, simplifying the language is important to that as exactly. well. Firming up faster is, mm-hmm. is important to that as well. But you didn't just join, I know you've been there about what, six months? Uh-huh. Roughly? Yep. Okay. Obviously, you didn't join this for short term, right? So exactly. what do you think the long term attractiveness mm-hmm. is to the captive space? And what is your vision for this company over that three or five year horizon? Yeah, I think there's just so much long term potential potential and and no I in it for the long haul obviously you you don't do it but but my vision is to continue to grow Blackwell and never lose that tagline right? never lose that that stability but never lose the flexibility okay. right no matter and then I also think use my industry and legal background to grow with our client base so you know where we are today will not be um what we may look like in even six months Mm -hmm. uh three years five years we did we we put millman under contract and we did five-year feasibility study and projections because i'm a long-term gal right absolutely and and know that those are aggressive um and so from a staffing perspective uh to you know overall sales to everything we do operationally I practice what I preach. I'm continually learning, uh, pivoting, and not in any way to make us unknown or, or unstable, but the, the continual um, ability to move with the industry as it moves. Yeah, you have to be. Right? You have to be constantly flexible, right, yeah. and to be able to adapt. But you know, obviously, you have a good vantage point as the chairwoman of SIA, and I wish I'd be remiss if we didn't at least bring that up. Although I wish we had more time to spend on that, but mm-hmm. that's got to give you a broad based vision about the future of healthcare is where sitting where you sit, seeing all the regulatory conversations that are happening and what Mm -hmm. the buzz is in the industry. So from that, what have you sort of gleaned about what people are concerned about Mm -hmm. over the next few years in healthcare? Is there anything in particular that you've latched onto? Oh, yeah. So I think um, the biopharmaceutical space, obviously, I think there are lots of questions on is value-based care working? Um, I think there are questions on movement towards home-based care. Okay good in some ways, really bad in others, um, because you're taking someone out of a clinical setting and you're taxing people at home, but, but you're at, yet you're at home. So there's so many things. One of the things I love about Cyan, and I've been volunteering for them for 20 years, so worked my all the way up from being a, a volunteer, right? We didn't have a young leaders division then, but um, 20 years time, unequivocally, that is the best think tank in our industry. And what happens is we all leave our egos and hats purposely at the door, right? And we come in and you share ideas and you solve problems and it's cutting edge stuff. And, And every time we have a call or we get together, I leave smiling because it is just great work product. Yeah. Um, I also like what we've done, again, over the last few years, you've been a big part of that with with young leaders, and how do we continue to stretch those boundaries and teach? Mm -hmm. So um, 
Unfortunately, I aged out of you. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I tried to get that change. I, yeah, I, I, that's okay. I aged out. I aged out. That's okay, right? It's yeah. just for the next the next generation of young folks. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. But, but so, like, big picture here, and kind of maybe we'll move into closing thoughts too, because I want you to be able to sort of weigh on mm-hmm. uh, just kind of wrap things up for the folks that are listening. But this big picture of what you're doing with a captive, and then maybe just leave the folks with your closing thoughts after that. Yeah. Just the innovation, embrace innovation, and captives are here to stay. There should be, you know, not just from our podcast, but there should be no doubt in any, anyone's mind in this industry. And I would challenge people to demystify it, right? Um, it's not a scary thing. Find someone who can do that for you or, or study up and learn, even if you to talk about it. You may not be necessarily placing business, mm-hmm. but but I think that like any solution or industry, you've got to know about it. Sure. So, so I think I'm going to challenge our listeners to um, learn, um, you know, and, and embrace that that's not going anywhere. It's just going to continue to increase. And how does that best work within their consulting well, and what I love about this is, you know, I mentioned obviously David Voorhees, I've had Phil Holoka, I had Stephanie Manning from ICS, now you, it's fourth time I've covered, maybe fifth time I've covered captives. And like, just because you have a different perspective or a slightly different way of doing things, you can go back and listen to all those episodes mm-hmm. and put them all together and have a much better understanding of what the vehicle itself is. Yeah. Then you go out and figure out, well, does, does Carrie's solution work here? Does Dave's work here? You know, it's up to the individual to decide what's mm-hmm. best fit for their employers. I just want to let people in on the conversation, right, right. to, to uh, reduce that barrier to entry in our industry to language and things like that. And you've done a, a great job of keeping those terms very simple. Um, but I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I, God, I'm kicking myself because I wish we had longer. So maybe I don't want to ask you to come back, but I may have to ask you to come back too, and we'll do a part two. I am coming back, okay. and I'll come back as many times as you, you'll have well, me. What I'd and... like to do is I'll put you on the hot seat. Would you like to be part of a, a captive that. round table? Oh, sure. Okay, cool. Absolutely. Awesome. Sold done. Sold done. You heard it right here. <laughs> Carrie's coming back. Well, again, we got to wrap it up. I know Nathan's got somewhere to go as well, and then somebody's beating on the door too. So I appreciate you coming. This has been a blast, and Such it's very nice pleasure. to meet you. It's a well. pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.